our topic tonight are, are <clears throat> news black holes, if you will. Places where it's difficult, if not impossible, for the media to cover the story. Uh, why this is so, what, what can be done to get around these, these obstacles, uh, what, are the, uh, what are the dangers of not being there, and uh, what, you know, the plus and minuses of such things as uh, citizen journalism. But to sort of set the stage first, perhaps we can look at a few areas where there is an acute problem. Um, and I think I'll start with Iran, if I may. We've had a, a correspondent fully accredited in the Bureau in Iran for a long time, um, but we started to fall out with the authorities when we wanted to launch Persian TV, because the Iranian authorities are, are less bothered about what's broadcast about Iran to the rest of the world, but are, like many countries, um, mm. uh, very concerned and acutely concerned about what is broadcast to their own population. So when we started to broadcast in Farsi into uh, Iran, they started to get quite agitated with the BBC and in the end threw our correspondent out uh, as a point of principle because we continued to with, persevere with our Persian service. Um, so we were um, served obviously by the agencies for a while but then they put pressure on the agencies to say if they continued to supply BBC Persian TV they would be thrown out uh, and so AP uh, started to block or, or say we couldn't use any of their material on Persian TV. Reuters to their credit ignored the threat and carried on and said you know we have a deal with you you can use it. Um, and, and stayed on and I think are still there. Um, how did we get by? In the end, uh, it was because of the relationship between our Persian TV channel and the audiences inside Iran, because at the height of the protests, um, uh, sort of five, six days in, we were receiving between six and eight video clips a minute. How do we verify what we're getting? How do we know it's what people are telling us it is? Uh, obviously it was quite difficult for us to get back in touch with people and to verify them and we had to be very careful about not identifying them on air and so on as well. Um, uh, you know, and there were, there were you know, a number of other of those kind of editorial policy issues about how we use that material. But um, in the end, new technology and a population that wanted to express itself um, uh, got us out of what would otherwise have been a black hole in, in terms of coverage. But w one other point I should make, of course, is that most of that material came from people on the streets and the protesters. One of the issues for us was, you know, Iran is, is a country that's split down the middle, and Ahmadinejad, um, whatever other people feel about him, still has 40, 50 percent support, and his supporters actually were less inclined to uh, come onto our airwaves. And you know, we had to work quite hard to think about how do we explain that this isn't just you know, on one side of the picture. How do we, how do we explain there is a, a different view in Iran from the one that the people on the street were expressing? So that was a, that was a challenge for us. It was the, mm. definitely it was the moment when Twitter, Twitter. Mm. exploded uh, into our consciousness as a, as a really, really powerful news gathering tool. Uh, and, you know, uh, we made a very good play of that. Funnily enough, um, three or four months ago, before that had happened, we'd actually appointed one of our online team to be a Twitter correspondent. Uh, which was, you know, a pretty backwater role until, frankly, the Iranian uh, uh, rallies that started happening. It became a very frontline role for us in terms of our on-screen reporting. But there were same the same sort of problems with verification of Twitter. I mean, for example, mm. we felt mm. there were uh, mm. several good Twitterers who we'd been tracking, who we felt pretty sure were making real and uh, up-to-date contributions about what was going on, um, you know, uh, uh, on the streets of Tehran. But then as it started to explode as a phenomenon, we found more and more people coming in and joining and posting who we were less sure about. I mean, we tracked one Tyranian Twitterer yeah. down to Streatham, for example, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> where apparently things were getting pretty bad. Uh, but um, so uh, there were issues like that, and we found we had to weed certain people out. Uh, we, we did a lot of digging uh, back on, on people. You know, we had five or six in the end, people who we really trusted, and we gave prominence to them. Were we absolutely sure? No, we're not, actually. Uh, you know, unless someone can chase an IP address down to wherever, you know, internet cafe, you, you, you know, it's, it's quite hard to do. What's very interesting is that, um, you know, you get new technologies which do open up extraordinary new things, but the problems remain, the fundamental principles remain absolutely the same. How do you, how do you know that this is a true story? How do you know that it's, and governments are as good, I mean, I think we've seen there's always a kind of technological utopianism at the beginning of a technology in which people believe that 
the technological breakthrough you've just had is on the side of democracy and the people and you know love and rock and roll and good things um, and then you find that in fact that technology even though as I get older I think I'm more of a technological determinant determinist actually and you know this is this is an incredible technologically driven revolution we're living through but you know governments learn too they're not stupid it isn't just the people who take things over um, groups learn learn too and so the issues of how you know that what you are it, it seems to be the two really mm. big problems are a as it were the classic problem of balance um, and the, the, the example that comes to mind is, is again Tibet because that was a very the, you know the BBC was absolutely swamped with um, anti Han Chinese um, stuff it was, um, and in fact there was a very different there was um, and the BBC's problem was to actually come up with the other side government whether or not you have a, you know, a Persian service or a uh, you know any other international service going into a country you know governments who who don't like your coverage will do all sorts of things to try to blackmail you and force you and squeeze you out and that happens you know all over the world all the time uh, and you have to, and if you if you kind of give way and you say oh, okay we'll pull back here they just try and take another mile so you know that's that's part of life of operating big particularly international news services uh, and I would say and actually I think um, most people in the BBC newsrooms and on the news desk would say that the advantages of having the Persian service and the direct relationship with people inside Iran that it has developed and the information and intelligence and understanding that we have um, uh, gathered and, and, and harvested, if you like, as a consequence of that, it, you know, far outweighs the disadvantage of temporarily being without a correspondent. And you know, these are hard trade-offs. And uh, you know, in the end, I just think if you, you know, I, mean, I don't know if there's anyone here from AP, and I don't particularly want to single them out, but I think if you give way to you know, author authoritarian regimes in the long term doesn't do any good. And, you know, you have points of principle, and our principle is we want that service, we're doing a decent job broadcasting it, uh, and we will hold the line and we'll take the consequences. You do these things, you know, to some extent are fashionable. Uh, stories uh, come in and come out of the news agenda, and Darfur isn't that fashionable at the moment. Maybe, you know, George Clooney's been busy making films or something. It hasn't been at mm -hmm. the top of the agenda recently, and, and one suspects that not a lot has changed. Uh, it is a real challenge, Darfur. It's a huge, you know, issue getting there, and no one really has ever completely nailed uh, on television or radio, as far as I'm aware. You know, the the real, you know, actual uh, persecution happening, or the di very direct aftermath of it. And uh, as a consequence, you're, you, you find yourself as a news organization always chasing the story and never, never feeling satisfied that you've got to the bottom of, of what's going on there. And of course, it's incredibly co complicated with different militia being sponsored by different parts of the government who are themselves factionalized and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, it, you know, I, I believe it is important when we, we in the media, um, you know, do our part to to put these issues right at the very top of the news agenda, that we do revisit them. And we don't just sort of consign them to being yesterday's or last year's news story. We do have a responsibility to, to, to follow up.